I think it's time for this toxic, binary, zero-sum madness to stop. We're not an imperial power. We're a revolutionary power. We are no longer in a world where you can plot out moves, statesman to statesman, like a chessboard. You don't know anything about my background or where I came from. It doesn't matter to you because fundamentally I'm a mean white man. We can't do this to the next generation because America will cease to exist. Welcome to The Monk Debates. Every episode, we provide you with a civil and substantive debate on the big issues of the day free of spin, focused on the facts, and animated by smart conversation. To arm you, the listener, with enough information to make up your own mind. Today's debate, be it resolved, the public health response to COVID-19 should focus on protecting the old and letting the young get on with living normal lives. think the pandemic is slowing down, think again. On Thursday, the World Health Organization reported a record single-day increase of global COVID-19 cases. Meanwhile, there are now 45 million coronavirus cases recorded worldwide, and 46% of new infections are in Europe. And they're prompting new warnings from health officials. Deaths in the U.S. hitting 230,556. And according to an internal memo, cases are on an upward trajectory in just about the entire country. Hello, I'm your moderator, Rudyard Griffiths. Well, we're heading into the 12th month of global pandemic, and in many places, the spread of COVID-19 shows no signs of slowing down. As infections continue to surge, countries in the Northern Hemisphere have started to reimpose lockdowns, restricting people's movement and social interactions, and closing significant portions of their economies. From... Thursday until the start of December, you must stay at home. You may only leave home for specific reasons. The hammer has dropped on wedding receptions and other celebrations of life here in Peel region as the number of COVID-19 cases... Broken glass in Turin as Italy breaks another record for daily cases of COVID-19. This, the result of anti-lockdown protests on Monday. Many political leaders and their public health advisors argue that these kinds of restrictions are necessary as crisis measures when infections are spiraling out of control, threatening to collapse hospitals and devastate public health. They also advocate a strategy of infection suppression to keep infections low once the crisis is brought under control and a vaccine is widely available. That is our major weapon against this virus right now. We don't have a vaccine that's deployable. This is the only thing we have, and we can get through it if everybody really leans forward and pushes on this. But some politicians and public health experts are criticizing what they believe is an overly draconian approach. White House officials have cited the Barrington Declaration, signed by dozens of doctors, stating in part, those who are not vulnerable should immediately be allowed to resume life as normal. The Great Barrington Declaration proposes um, that we allow people who are young and healthy uh, and very unlikely to die of COVID-19 to return to life as normal. They also argue that countries should adopt a focused approach to fighting the pandemic that zeroes in on protecting the elderly and vulnerable. On this installment of the Monk Debates, we challenge the essence of these arguments by debating the motion, be it resolved, the public health response to COVID-19 should focus on protecting the old and letting the young get on with living normal lives. Arguing for the motion is Martin Kaldorf, professor of medicine at Harvard University. He's one of the authors of the recently released Great Barrington Declaration, which advocates an alternative risk-based approach to combating the COVID-19 pandemic. Arguing against the motion is Stephen Reicher, professor of psychology at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He currently sits on a subgroup of SAGE, the official scientific body advising the UK government on its COVID-19 response. Martin, Stephen, welcome to the Monk Debates. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. Hello from a damp Scotland. (laughs) Well, look, gentlemen, I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. This is a moment, I think, where uh, much of the world now faces uh, a proverbial second wave of COVID-19. We're anxious about what the coming weeks and months uh, portend. 
And we're having a, a fairly vigorous uh, debate in society in the corridors of power about how uh, we should manage this second wave. Our resolution today uh, is be it resolved, the public health response to COVID-19 should focus on protecting the old and letting the young get on with living normal lives. Martin, you're going to be arguing in favor of our motion, so I'm going to put two minutes on our clock for opening statements and pass the proverbial microphone over to you. Thank you. So the lockdowns that we've seen uh, from this pandemic um, has been the worst assault on the working class in many decades in the United States since uh, segregation and uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, what we're doing is we are protecting low-risk college students and low-risk young professionals who can work from home, people like lawyers, journalists, and scientists, while older working-class people who are high-risk, they must be out there making a living, uh, driving a bus or a cab, working as a janitor, working in the supermarkets. Uh, and these older high-risk people are being exposed uh, to the virus, and they are the ones who are building up the immunity in the population that will uh, eventually protect uh, all of us. What we're doing is we are both having a strategy that uh, results to far too many uh, deaths in the United States. It's over 200,000 deaths in the United States, many of which could have been avoided if we have uh, taking a more basic public health approach to this pandemic. And it's similar in many European countries. So the key feature with COVID-19 is that there's a thousandfold difference in risk. Everybody can get infected, but there's a thousandfold difference in risk in mortality in death between the oldest and the youngest. And that's something we have to utilize as we fight this enemy. So what we proposed, and which is part of the Great Barrington Declaration that was signed uh, six weeks ago, is we have to be much better at protecting older people. And for younger people, children have less risk for COVID-19 than they have from the annual influenza. At the same time, the burden of the lockdown is enormous on these children and on young adults because uh, of the collateral damage and other aspects of public health. Thank you, Martin, for that opening statement. Clear, concise. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, Stephen, we're going to now have you argue against our motion, your opening remarks on our resolution, be it resolved, the public health response to COVID-19 should focus on protecting the old and letting the young get on with living normal lives. Let's have your opening remarks, please. Well, let me start by saying that I completely agree with Martin on two things. The first is that certain groups, the young, the poor, ethnic minorities have had a raw deal out of this pandemic and we need to do something about it. And secondly, the way we're doing things, this cycle of restrictions and relaxations of second and possibly third and fourth lockdowns is not the right way to do things. There is another way. My concern is that the strategy, the great Barrington Declaration strategy, actually will make these things worse, not better. You see, it's one of those things that sounds in the abstract rather appealing, but it rests on a series of assumptions, a series of ifs. And when you look closely at each of those ifs, you realize they're impossibilities. So the first thing, protect the vulnerable. If we were to say that people over 65 should be sequestered, well, something like 20, 25% of the population is in that bracket. In the United States, uh, it's 54 million people. In Canada, 7 million. In the UK, it's 13 million. And if you add people with comorbidities, which makes them vulnerable, you're going even higher to about 30%. Now, you cannot tear society apart and sequester those people away. It's simply not possible. You look at the people who care for them. In fact, in Canada, there are more carers, unpaid carers, than there are uh, people uh, aged over 65, 7.8 million, in fact. So it's an impossibility to sequester these people. Martin, you, you will know that your colleague, William Hanage has likened it a little bit to having a fire in your house and putting your valuables in one room and fanning the flames elsewhere. In the end, the sparks will get in. Secondly, when you talk about sending uh, people out, the people who will go out and catch the infection will be the underprivileged. And when you talk about the damage, it's not a binary, it's not death or life. 
We know, and increasingly we know, that long COVID causes huge amounts of of damage. So, for instance, 25% of people who have COVID have long-term symptoms akin to PSTD. 38% of them, two months later, have abnormal chest radiographs. 70% of them, two months later, have got fatigue. And the notion that there will be soon a point where we can let the elderly out because uh, there will be uh, immunity amongst the, the majority of the population, again, doesn't stand up. We don't know how long it will be, first of all, nobody can say. And secondly, we don't know if that immunity will build up. And we've seen in big studies recently, the amount of antibodies has fallen. We saw it in Manaus in the Amazon uh, rainforest, where there was a huge amount of infection the first time round, it's now having a huge second spike. So the notion that we will somehow solve things this way also is a fantasy. But the biggest fantasy of all, biggest mistake of all, is another binary. The notion that we think it's either focus protection or lockdown. Lockdown is an emergency measure. And the ultimate irony is is that the notion that you should simply avoid restrictions has simply postponed restrictions, which has meant that when they have to be put in place, they take longer and are more, more severe than before. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, now our chance for um, some targeted timed rebuttals. This is an opportunity for both of you to kind of zero in on uh, the key points in each other's arguments that you'd like to take exception with. Uh, Martin, I'm going to put another two minutes or so on the clock for you. What in what you've just heard from Stephen uh, would you like to bring to our listeners' attention? So there were a few mischaracterization of the Great Barrington Declaration, but one of them is that uh, we are not proposing to lock down uh, older people. The more we drag out this pandemic, the harder it is for older people to actually protect themselves. And it's very hard for old people who now, having been protecting themselves for many, many months, to have to continue to do that. Another aspect that I think has to be, be said very clearly is that we have immunity to COVID-19. We don't know if it will be lifelong immunity or if it will last uh, a number of years. Uh, my guess is the latter probably, but uh, that is sort of irrelevant in terms of building up the immunity that we need to end this pandemic. There has been a misunderstanding that immunity is only those who have antibodies, that detectable antibodies, and that's not correct completely biologically, they will often have detectable antibodies for a while, but then you can't detect them anymore. But that doesn't mean that they aren't immune. And we know that because people don't get reinfected in in large numbers. Also, there's other types of immunity like T-cell immunity. So the notion that we don't have immunity to this uh, disease is mistaken. Thank you, Martin. Um, Stephen, your opportunity to provide a um, a rebuttal, um, take out the proverbial marker and underline any key points in in Martin's argument that you'd like to flag for our audience? Well, let me start off where Martin started, by saying this has had a huge effect on poorer people, on the working classes. And he's quite right in that respect. But the response to that is not to expose people more, those aged under 65. The response to that is to address the inequalities in our society, including within the pandemic. And so, of course, If you bring in measures that restrict people, you have to do something which makes it possible to abide by those restrictions. So the answer there doesn't lie in removing protections. It lies in actually providing those resources. And a number of places in the world have done that. One of the most remarkable places being Kerala in southern India. With over a thousand local bodies across Kerala, Chief Minister Pinrai Vijayan has announced for one community kitchen to be set up by each of them in next one week to provide free cooked hot meals to anyone in need. A challenge for many as India is under lockdown. The second point is about the notion of lockdown. And again, I want to stress that I'm not suggesting that lockdown is the solution. Lockdown is a short-term emergency measure to get things to a point where you can manage them through more proportionate measures. And the reason why things have spiked again is that when we lifted those restrictions in the summer, we didn't put those measures in place. We didn't, in the UK, in the US, have decent test and trace systems. They failed us. That's one key reason. Secondly, we didn't have good regulation to make sure that workplaces and public spaces were actually safe for people. 
And thirdly, we didn't support people. In the UK, for instance, no more than 11% of people self-isolate when asked to do so because for most of them, it's financially and practically impossible. So if you had proportionate, sensible measures to suppress the virus, then you wouldn't need lockdown. Thank you, Stephen. Well, look, now it's um, an opportunity for the three of us to have a conversation to move through uh, some of the the key issues uh, regarding our our motion today. And and that's what I want to start with. I want to just refocus us on our resolution that we're debating, which is, be it resolved, the public health response to COVID-19 should focus on protecting the old and letting the young get on with living normal lives. So, Martin, to come to you first, I'd, I'd like to hear a bit more from you on Stephen's point, how one can practically uh, do that, let the young get on living normal lives and protect the old simultaneously when it's clear that this is a highly contagious virus, much more contagious than normal influenza. Let's hear a bit more from you about why, you know, that isn't a, a powerful argument against uh, allowing this this virus to spread amongst younger populations. Uh, so first of all, uh, nobody's arguing to let the virus spread. Uh, what we're arguing is let people live their lives, even though some of them will be infected. So that's different from letting the virus spread. Uh, everybody should wash their hands and everybody should stay home when sick and so on. What we have to stop is the lockdowns that are extremely damaging to uh, collateral damage on other aspects of public health, on education and so on. So the argument to say that we can't separate the old and the young is sort of very disingenuous for two reasons. Uh, one is that it hasn't been tried in, in the UK or in the US, for example. So it's sort of difficult to say that, well, it can't be done if you haven't even bothered to trying it. There are very good measures we can do, basic public health measures to better protect the, the old. The other reason that is very disingenuous is we have actually been extremely successful in uh, shifting the risk of infection from the professional class to the working class. If we look at the data, there's much more infection and much more mortality among the working class and especially the inner city working class. We're learning more this week about why the coronavirus is still hammering two of Canada's biggest cities, Toronto and Montreal. It's now spreading rapidly in the community among essential workers, people like taxi drivers, retail employees and factory workers. So we were actually very successful in protecting the more affluent members of society and the professionals, where we uh, absolutely failed to protect the, the less affluent and the working class and the poor. So uh, it is possible to shift this risk. And the way to do it, uh, it depends on the living situation of these older people. There are a lot of things we can do to better protect the nursing home. And I think it's a scandal that we're not doing it. A second group are older people who live uh, live at home. For example, we need to uh, help them so that they can have groceries and other necessities delivered to them so that they don't have to go and expose themselves in the supermarket. We could use pension funds or disability funds who let those older working adults be protected during the height of the transmission so that they can stay home, not go to the working place. Okay, let me bring uh, Stephen in and have him react to those policy prescriptions. And maybe, Stephen, if you could just address a question that's really been on my mind and that Martin brought up in his opening statement is that that thousandfold differential between the groups least at risk of dying of this virus and those most at risk, that would seem like something that is so large that it really has to be baked into the public health response. Mm. Well, first of all, the thousand is the extreme of very young people and very old people. And we're not talking about just the very young and the very old. We're talking about the difference between uh, those over 65 and those under 65. And there the differential is far, far less. Once you get over 45, then there begin to be reasonably substantial uh, dangers. Secondly, of course, it is already there in the responses. So, for instance, uh, in the UK at the moment, we have restrictions, but schools are kept open because we recognise the huge lifelong harms of keeping schools closed. So, of course, it's recognised. And the third point, 
of course, is that people, uh, it's not just about the individual who is infected, it's about spreading the infection. And as uh, Andrew Cuomo put it beautifully early on in the pandemic, he said, this isn't an I thing. It's not about what happens to me. It's a we thing, because what you do can infect me and get your head around the we concept. And when you say things haven't been tried, well, let me give you a couple of examples. I am a keen cyclist. If you saw the great cycling tours went ahead this summer, the Tour of Spain, the Tour of Italy, and the Tour of France, the greatest of all. And at each of those, they try to create hermetically sealed bubbles. They tried to do absolutely everything they could to seal off the tour from the rest of the society. As the cyclists are under strict guidelines to isolate as much as possible, there won't be the usual autographs and selfies. And they'll get regularly tested for COVID-19 throughout the race. To reduce the risk of infection, the usual crowds are for now a thing of the past, with only 50 people at the starting point in Nice. Large black panels have been set up to stop crowds forming. A series of measures which go far beyond what would be practical for 25% of the population, and they failed. The infections got in. Quite a lot of people got infected. Again, you cannot separate things uh, like that. You can't tear society apart in that way. And the other point I'd want to make is that when you talk about the inequities of uh, the pandemic, absolutely true, they are there. But if you say to people, go about your ordinary lives, Of course, it's not a choice. It's not a choice because some people have got the privilege to be able to work at home and some people don't. So what you're saying when you say let people go about their ordinary lives is you're saying let's take away the state protections, which ensure that people don't have to go out. And when you take away those protections, again, it's the most vulnerable who are going to be most exposed. So you're describing the problems with the lockdown approach that we've had uh, during this year. So that's sort of kind of strange. But Martin, time and time again, I have argued that I don't support lockdown. Lockdown, as I say, is an emergency measure when things are running out of control and the alternative would be even worse. They reflect the failure of the proportionate measures by the state, by employers, by um, owners of hospitality spaces and by the public to be able to live with this, bring uh, levels of infection down so that we can go out. So I think uh, this was an argument that was used in the spring for the lockdown, that we were supposed to have a lockdown for a while and then uh, we were going to be fine. And I think those of us who were arguing against lockdown in the spring were saying, well, we can suppress the disease temporarily, but it will be back. It's the same thing in Ireland now. They are going into a sort of a circuit break lockdown And they have been able to suppress the disease by doing so. But as soon as they lift it, the disease is going to be back. Uh, So contact tracing and testing in isolation, that's an enormously important tool in the toolbox in infectious disease epidemiology and dealing with infectious disease outbreaks. The problem is that you can't uh, use every tool for every disease because every disease is different. You can't use contact tracing for annual influenza, for example, if nobody's even attempting it because it's impossible. The same is true for COVID-19. We can suppress the virus with uh, very fierce uh, lockdowns, but once that is suppressed, we cannot continue to do that with the contact tracing. It doesn't work. It's just going to come back. So we would have to keep the lockdowns in place until we have a vaccine that uh, can create the immunity that uh, is needed to then end the pandemic. And the damage from the lockdowns to date is already much bigger uh, enormously and something that we're gonna have to live with and die with for many years to come. For example, childhood immunization rates are uh, have plummeted. And we see now in some parts of the world that we have measles outbreak that we shouldn't have in this, uh, in this age if people were getting their proper vaccines. So people are dying from cardiovascular disease when they shouldn't be. You have less cancers this year, but that's not because there are less cancers, just that we're not diagnosing them. The mental health uh, has deteriorated. It is devastating in all age groups. Uh, I have a close colleague at my university who works with uh, families with uh, children with autism, and it's actually brutal what they have had to go through because of the, these lockdowns. 
with uh, less schooling and less care for autistic children. And that's just one tiny example of mental health issues. Uh, there are so many more. So these consequences of these very misguided lockdowns that we have had and that many countries, honestly, is continuing to push for, uh, that's, gonna, that's having very long-term consequences. So that also goes against one of the basic principles of public health is that we don't only look at the short term, we have to look at the long term. Hi there, Rudyard Griffiths, the moderator of this podcast. This we know, our society is dangerously polarized. We don't listen to each other, we don't search out opposing views. Instead, too many of us live in tribes, convinced that we are right and they are wrong. It's time to put a stop to polarization before it wrecks our democracy. This is what The Monk Debates is all about, ending polarization, searching for common ground. We do this week in and week out by producing this podcast through our dialogue series and through our main stage debates on the big topics of the day. Support civil and substantive public debate by becoming a Monk member. As a member, you get access to our 10 plus year online library of great debates and streaming high definition video, a free Monk debate book of your choice, ticketing privileges, and more. 30% off until December 1st when you use the promo code MONKPOD2020 at our website, monkdebates.com. Again, that promo code MONK, M-U-N-K, POD2020. Join now and help the fight against the polarization of our democracy. Now, back to our program. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up for our audience the topic of, of herd immunity. And maybe to come to you first on this, Stephen, you know, I'm just curious, why can't herd immunity be a good thing working in concert with a vaccine? And why shouldn't we encourage, in effect, from the public health response, younger people who are not particularly at risk to acquire natural immunity now? Well, first of all, I don't like the term herd immunity. Um, as a psychologist, I'm aware that it has a, uh, a rather dismissive uh, attitude towards uh, the public. I think population immunity is, is, is probably a better term. And if you want to influence people, it's not a very good uh, idea to start off by calling them a herd. The point about so-called herd immunity is it is normally seen as something which comes from a vaccine. We have never historically just said to people, well, let's get immunity by letting the virus rip. And if we did that, I think the, 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 the number of deaths would just be absolutely intolerable. It would also overwhelm our health services and therefore mean we would get all that other form of damage because we can't treat people in, in, in all sorts of other ways. It's not something to pursue. It's not responsible to let something this damaging uh, spread through the population. As I say, one of the points that we've got to get away from is the fact that if you don't die, you're fine. If we're talking about uh, psychiatric effects of uh, the pandemic, well, there are studies which show that 25% of people, a quarter of all people who get COVID, uh, have got uh, symptoms which are akin to PTSD. It has all sorts of other physical effects, and we're learning about them virtually every day. It affects the heart the lungs, the kidney, uh, the liver, the brain. One recent study showed 70% of people had some form of heart damage. This latest study just published in JAMA Cardiology really breaks down what we're learning about longer term effects on the heart. Uh, this study looked at 100 COVID patients in Germany. Not all of them had severe disease, then did a cardiac MRI. And this MRI showed evidence of ongoing inflammation in 60% of those wow. patients and some type of cardiac involvement in 78% of patients. So again, a strategy which tries to get safety by exposing so many millions of people to a disease whose harms we're learning more about every day seems to me very deeply irresponsible. But I, I just want to come back again, because I think it's such an important point that you often can win an argument by setting up false oppositions. Right. If the alternative between something bad and something truly terrible is given, you're going to choose something bad. And if it were the choice that the choice is between the strategy of 
so-called focus protection and eternal lockdown, I, <laughs> I wouldn't support eternal lockdown. But that isn't the strategy. What's more, a strategy of proportionate responses. And the first thing that will be involved in that is indeed a better test and trace uh, system, which would include backward tracing so you could find the sources of outbreak uh, and, and then deal with them. And then uh, isolation for those people with full support, not self-isolation, supported isolation. And then um, if on top of that, um, you uh, make sure that all your public spaces are safe, then you can suppress the virus. And while it hasn't been perfect, I would prefer to live in those countries which have tried that, countries you know, like New Zealand, like Australia, like Taiwan, like South Korea. And finally, when it comes to the economy, Paul Krugman, the Nobel winning prize winner, uh, pointed out that those countries which have had more uh, robust reactions and which have had better results in terms of public health have also done better on the economy. With proportionate measures, we can minimise the economic damage, we can minimise the public health damage in the short term and in the long term. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Let's, um, Martin, just have some some thoughts from you on population immunity and why you think this is a a viable and necessary strategy for governments to incorporate into their official uh, COVID-19 response? Because this is clearly a, a point of differentiation and argument between you and Stephen. Um, actually, it's not. I agree with Stephen that herd immunity is not a strategy. Herd immunity is a well-established scientific phenomena. Before there were vaccines, every every epidemic and pandemic ended with herd immunity. So. Um, to talk about herd immunity as a strategy is like saying that an airplane pilot should use gravity as a strategy to land the plane. I would hope that the pilots will uh, take into account gravity as uh, in their uh, strategy for uh, for landing the plane, but the strategy is to land the plane with as few casualties as possible so that people don't die. And that's the same thing here. Uh, we will reach herd immunity sooner or later for, for COVID-19. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And the strategy is to minimize the mortality uh, until we get there. Uh, and we do that by doing as good a job as possible in protecting the high-risk elderly. And when it comes to the young people, nobody should go out there and deliberately get infected. But if we have a, a staff person for a nursing home who has had COVID-19 and who is immune, that's a good thing because it means that person cannot uh, give the disease to uh, the nursing home residents. So young people that have had the disease and who are immune is actually a good thing for society and a good thing for protecting the high-risk elderly. And the longer we postpone this pandemic, the harder it is to uh, protect the elderly. Thank you, uh, Martin. Look, just before we move to closing statements, I, I, I want to have both of you reflect on on where we are today and how you think about the public policy response, not in terms of what might be ideal at some point in the past, but what do we do right now? You know, looking, especially let's take the example of the United States, Martin, I begin with you. I mean, North Dakota, almost 9,000 cases per 100,000. Wisconsin, uh, close to 6,000 cases per 100,000. Iowa, much the same. I mean, it looks in these states and in much of the United States that this virus has truly become endemic. Why wouldn't a reset, a circuit breaker, whatever you want to call it, a lockdown, why isn't that the right public policy response now to deal with something that has gotten out of control? What, Martin, is your advice right now? One thing we have to stop doing is counting cases. That's not very useful from an epidemiological point of view because cases depends a lot how much testing we do. If we do testing among students, uh, for example, where most of them will be asymptomatic, some will be mildly symptomatic. So the three major ma metrics that we want to use is hospitalizations, mortality, and ultimately the most important one is the excess death. And uh, the United States uh, has over 200,000 COVID-19 deaths, but it has over 300,000 uh, excess deaths from this year compared to the same periods uh, in previous years. So that means that we have almost 100,000 excess deaths that's not diagnosed as COVID-19 for other reasons like cardiovascular disease. 
The study found deaths from dementia and heart disease significantly increased. Doctors believe people with acute emergencies and chronic diseases like diabetes that weren't properly cared for also fell victim. If the trend continues, researchers say the U.S. could see more than 400,000 excess deaths by the end of 2020. These are consequences of the disastrous lockdowns that we had in the spring. And we can compare, for example, the U.S. with Sweden. What is interesting is that Sweden has 6,000 COVID-19 deaths, but the number of excess deaths compared to the previous five years is only 2,000. So unlike the United States that has more excess deaths than COVID-19 deaths, Sweden has only a third of excess deaths compared to COVID deaths. And Sweden uh, did not lock down in the same way as most other countries. They kept the schools open throughout uh, the height of the pandemic from ages 1 to 15. So I think Sweden is something about which there's been a lot of misunderstanding. So, first of all, in Sweden, there were a whole series of restrictions uh, on gatherings, uh, on uh, hospitality. Um, In schools, the older kids are doing online teaching at home, which hasn't happened in other countries. So quite a lot of restrictions in Sweden. Number two, in Sweden, when you do comparisons... Of course, there are a thousand and one factors that feed into those uh, comparisons. So we need to compare like with like. So let's compare Sweden, not with very different countries, Britain and the United States, where there's been austerity, huge cuts in public services, huge cuts in the health service. Let's compare them with other Scandinavian countries. So look at deaths per million. In Sweden, it's 574. In Denmark, it's 108. In Finland, it's 61. In Norway, it's 40. So Sweden is about six times as high uh, as the next country and about 15 times as high as its neighbour, Norway. And has that um, saved their economy? No, the hit to their economy has been every bit as big. And has uh, having more deaths and more infections early on mean less of a second wave? No, right now the infection rate in uh, Sweden is three and a half times that of its neighbour, Norway. So in many ways, Sweden is not a success story. It's actually a failure story. In terms of your question of what we should do now, let me tack to something we haven't really talked about, which is that when you look at the countries that have done really well, then what you find is that one of the critical things is public trust between government and uh, the population. So the population understand the need for restrictions and go along with them. So in many ways, I think that proportionate restrictions need to be combined with public trust. And here I suspect that uh, uh, Martin and I might agree that one of the critical things that a government has got to do is not wag its finger at people and tell them what to do. It's to support them to do the right thing. Stephen, let's go to closing statements. Uh, we've had a fulsome debate here. This is an opportunity for you to, to sum up uh, any of your key arguments. Well, I think we'd all agree we're in a crisis right now, a global crisis, probably the greatest cl- uh, global crisis of uh, most of our lifetimes. And when there are crises, uh, people in Britain often like to roll out Winston Churchill. So I'm going to adapt a quotation, a famous quotation uh, from Churchill, which actually he made about Russia, but that's irrelevant. And I want to suggest that the Great Barrington Declaration might sound seductive, but in the end, it's an illusion wrapped up in a dream inside a misunderstanding. It's an illusion to believe that you can isolate and protect 30% of the population. The less that you sequester them, the more you put them at risk. The more you protect them from risk, the more you lock them away uh, in a way that is unequal and unfair. And in the end, the sparks will always get in. The dream is that we can send out the other 70% of the population, without there being massive damage. We are talking about, uh, probably in the United States, hundreds of thousands, if not more, of people actually dying, and then clogging up the health system. So people will also die because they can't be treated in other ways. The fact that more people are dying of other things is precisely because the levels of infection are too high. And don't forget long covid 
to send out that many millions of young people who've made such sacrifices to keep the pandemic under control and expose them to a disease where we don't know the consequences and above all, the people who you're uh, forcing to go out are going to be the least privileged, the ones who can't work at home, the ones who are working in forward uh, and public-facing uh, jobs, the ones who are in crowded accommodation, the ones who have to use public transport. Right? It is absolutely unethical, quite apart from ineffective, to think you can send out that many people in the middle of a pandemic without terrible uh, consequences. And the third point is this. This is not a choice between lockdown and focus protection. So it's not lockdown versus Great Barrington. Both of those, I think, are unhelpful and destructive responses. We can suppress this virus. As I say, if the government takes its responsibilities uh, to support us, if employers and owners make sure that premises are safe, and if we take our responsibilities seriously to go along with those restrictions, then we can live largely safely until such time that medical advances allow us to see COVID-19 as part of history. Thank you, Stephen Martin. We're going to give you the last word in this debate. Two minutes on the clock for your summation. So first, I would like to thank both uh, the Monk debate and especially Stephen for uh, engaging in this uh, scientific discourse. Stephen talked about trust in public health, and I think that I 100% I agree that it's so critically important. And uh, one important way to get trust in the public is to have this kind of open scientific discourse and debates. Back in March, April, even though I have worked on infectious disease outbreaks for two decades, I work at a reasonably respectable university, I was, it was impossible for me to publish any of my thoughts on the pandemic in the United States, and there are many others uh, like me who had similar difficulty doing that. Uh, so uh, to have this uh, debate now, uh, I think it's incredibly important both for dealing with the pandemic as well as to try to restore some of the trust from the public in public health. Uh, another aspect of trust, I think, is it, it's highly responsible to uh, send out uh, predictions of uh, hundreds of thousands or millions dead in, uh, in COVID-19, as has been done by some scientists. Uh, the number of deaths will depend on the strategy. If we let this uh, go, go freely in society and just drift through society, there will be many deaths because many old people will be infected and, and some of those will die. If we protect everybody equally, we will postpone things in the future, but still we will have a fair amount of old people who, uh, who die uh, because they will be infected. So the m way to minimize death is through this uh, uh, focus protections. And another scaremongering is the long COVID things. There has not been a single study that I have seen that shows that these complications is more from COVID-19 than they are from uh, annual influenza. And the percentages that was given earlier in, in this uh, presentations, uh, they are based on people who uh, actually have some severe form of COVID. It doesn't include those who are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and doesn't even know they had COVID. And when it comes to politicians, there are three things that I think every politician should have to understand and should demand from any advisors that they use. Uh, and that's the three principles of public health. One is, it's not just short-term, it's long-term. It's not one disease, COVID-19, it's public health as a whole. And it's not only the safety of us scientists and journalists and politicians and lawyers and other professionals, it is the safety uh, and well-being of the whole population, including working class and the poor, the inner cities, as well as uh, the, the poor in the rest of the world. So thank you so much for having this debate and thank you, Stephen, for engaging in it in a very civilized and good mannered uh, uh, way. Thank you so much. Well, I wanna second that that note. You know, this is a an incredibly polarized moment uh, that we're all living through. So much of our collective discourse is uh, shrill, incoherent, and uh, deeply unsatisfying. And I think today, both of you have shown how civility and substance provides for a real opportunity for education, learning, and uh, coming away from this conversation with some new and important insights, uh, whatever your perspective is on how we should proceed 
to fight COVID-19 uh, from here on out. So on behalf of the Monk Debates community, thank you both so much for being generous with your time, for coming on, for engaging with each other, for listening to each other's arguments, and for providing us with such a, a terrific conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Well, that wraps up today's debate. I want to thank our participants, Professor Stephen Reicher and Martin Koldorf. The Monk Debates podcast is that special place for civil and substantive debate on the big issues of the day. To listen to more debates on everything from the latest developments on the U.S. election to what COVID-19 means for the future of, well, just about everything, to great debates on climate change, religion, you name it, we've got it all at www.monkdebates.com. You can also find detailed show notes on today's debate. Thank you for helping us bring back the art of public debate one conversation at a time. I'm your moderator, Rudyard Griffiths. The Monk Debates are produced by Antica Productions and supported by the Monk Foundation. Rudyard Griffiths, Marilyn Mazurik, and Christina Campbell are the producers. Abi Raheja is the associate producer. The Monk Debates podcast is mixed by Kieran Lynch. The president of Antica Productions is Stuart Cox. Be sure to download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like us, feel free to give us a five-star rating. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>